All right, thank you all for coming. This is DevOps Theory versus Practice, A Song of Ice and Tire Fire. Um, quick show of hands. Uh, does anyone here work for Google or Netflix or oh. other companies that would consider themselves thought leaders at the forefront of tech innovation? Okay. Uh huh. So that's the part of the room we need to watch for. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, good. There's always going to be someone angry. Most of you don't, and that's okay because we have decided to help you with this. Thought leaders are. You're not dressed like a thought leader. What is this? Yeah, well, give me a second. Thank you. It's always important to see how people at other companies that bear little to no relation to our own tend to solve interesting problems. So as a result, we've decided to go directly there. Let me try this for, for thought leader. Of course. It's hard to dispense wisdom from on high if you yourself are down low. Exactly. Fix your collar, please. Mm. If you pop the collar, that's the, 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 the I don't even want to go there. Does that this feel, feel better? It does. All right, we'll it stick to this It feels a little bit less like a therapy hour. Wonderful. So, by way of introduction, this is Leonid. You all know Leonid. He works at all of the fascinating tech companies simultaneously due to an incredibly convoluted scheduling algorithm. It's really something to behold, and frankly, we're quite proud of that. Unfortunately, because I think so hard about our industry, and I think deep about those things 24-7. Sometimes my thoughts are too abstract for the common folk to understand, so I brought a translator with me. Exactly. You hear his accent. English is obviously not his first language. His first language is thought leader. That's my entire role, that and to look good. It's the only skill sets I've got. So shall we begin leading thoughts? Absolutely. Please, take it so, away. So let's start with the first one. You know, at Acme Inc., we believe that our software has to be releasable anytime during the day or night. So in case you show up home drunk on Friday at 2 a.m. and you have a brilliant idea, you've got to be able to commit it and put it right in front of customers. It's 2 in the morning and you just wrote a line of code. It would be criminal for you not to share that line of code with 10 million users in less than three minutes. Go. Wake up. Oh, Thought sorry. Me. Test automation is obviously important to the modern world of continuous delivery and where every business is a software company. We believe everything has to be covered with 100% of test automation. There's a relatively minor task that has to be performed every eight months or so, and it takes three minutes. If you don't spend four weeks writing tests around that one function, you are a dangerous maniac. Wake up again. Press button, receive thought leadership. Security is at the top of the, at the forefront of the thought of every business leader today, giving the news and the recent breaches such of companies such as Equifax. We've worked very, very hard to make sure that our continuous delivery process also includes continuous security. We do it extremely well, and our code is 100% secure. They employ 50,000 engineers. Six of them work in security. It's generally something bolted on at the last minute. In the event that there is an issue, they blame anyone they can. When a third party responsibly discloses a vulnerability, they very politely and sincerely have that person killed. Oh, Oop, and we're back. One more. Oh, yeah, of course, uh, having a high availability of your software 24 7, 365 throughout the world is incredibly important, much more important than any other consideration. And therefore, you need to enable your development team to be as productive to create that highly available software. Disk encryption and laptop firewalls slow him down. So as a result, he doesn't use them. Also, because testing on high fidelity copies of production data is important, he has $80 billion worth of customer credit card information on that laptop. There's no problem here. <laughs> Lastly, we've been thinking about how to run our railroad because we're so uniquely differentiated from the rest of the industry. Obviously, virtual machine provisioning is very difficult, so we spend a lot of our effort building our custom homegrown bespoke tools, and then we release them open source for you to admire, but never to use. Your company's business purpose is to make and sell socks. Therefore, it is of the utmost importance that you build your own bespoke container orchestration system in order to wind up handling infrastructure deployments. That's why we call it sock compliance. And there's two of them. 
To continue on that thought, we also realized our other needs when it comes to our software delivery process are so unique between artifact management, monitoring, vulnerability scanning. No vendor could ever understand the complexity of our business, so we build everything ourselves. Vendor tools are inherently crappy because the engineers who work there are shitty. If they were good, they wouldn't work there. They'd work here instead. Why would you trust code written by crappy people? It makes no sense. Write your own. And lastly, because we want to employ the best, we decided that we're going to have our development team no other place but the center of San Francisco. We are so innovative and disruptive that we have taken a job that can be done from literally anywhere and created a land crunch in seven square miles located in an earthquake zone. And having spent um, the last couple of days um, at the conference here, uh, this is my third Swamp Up, uh, I believe that our new thought would be that no metrics are relevant. Forget about profits, forget about velocity, forget about uptime. The most important software metric for your business is li how liquid your software is. Uh, who here works for JFrog? He's too far to tackle you. Okay, yeah, he's, I don't know, he seems pretty big. I have no problems with anything he just said. Liquid software is the way to go. <laughs> thank, thank you, that's our talk. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. Now, on a more serious note, uh, my name is Leonard Agonic. I'm a recovering B2B executive. Uh, run uh, engineering teams at companies like Taleo, Oracle, CA. I'm on a bit of a professional sabbatical, and from time to time, I help companies that go to conferences, not like that, but others, and bring interesting ideas, sometimes out of context, to implement in their software organizations. And I'm Corey Quinn. I'm a cloud economist, which means I spend my life fixing the horrifying AWS bill. I also write the popular weekly newsletter that makes fun of Amazon. Subscribe at last week in AWS.com. And That's your course, best radio announcer voice? Eh, eh, that was everyone's weak. a critic. And I advise companies like Reactive Ops where no matter what your problem is, they will fix it by pouring Kubernetes all over it. <laughs> all right. So hopefully by now you get the message, right? Getting advice from conferences without understanding how to apply it or where you are as a company and what your business needs is probably not the right way to do business. But to understand how we got to where we've gotten with some of our industry, we're going to take a little detour into history and uh, geography with Professor Quinn. When you're talking about technology, it's only logical to go talk about the anthropology of certain geographic regions. Let's talk about the Pacific Islands, specifically right around the advent of World War II. War has broken out on a global scale, and suddenly the largest armies the world had ever seen are using these relatively unpopulated areas as staging areas. And virtually overnight, you see things like airports coming up, massive amounts of war supplies being brought in. And again, these were not, they were, they were sparsely inhabited, but they weren't uninhabited. People lived there, and they'd never seen anything like this. So they see these facilities go up, and in a matter of days, this bounty from the skies appears, food, medicine, weapons, just appears. So they did what any of us would do as we saw something like that and wanted to replicate some of those behaviors. That's right. They went on Hacker News to reinvent everything from first principles, ignoring anything that might shift that in one direction or another. And it made sense. OK, you have a bunch of supplies coming in when an airport gets built. Ah, so they built a bunch of fake airports out of wood and waited for supplies to arrive. They didn't. This is true. This is called a cargo cult. You may know people that subscribe to cargo cults. For example, you may have had a coworker who came from a conference and said, perhaps we should run Chaos Monkey in our production environment. Absolutely. It's, oh, great, because that's a terrific thing to do for your network that runs ATMs. I can't see any problems with that. So these islanders were not stupid. Far from it. They missed context. We think that's what's missing from a lot of this. So what we want to talk about is how to get context and apply it to problems that you have 
today. So let's look at some of the examples where we can get context in the technology industry today. You know, you can go to an analyst like Forrester, Gartner. You could read a book. Only one of those three offerings, by the way, is not for pay-for-play pay, pay opportunity. If you'd like to read that book, it is propping up a table near you. Well, here's an example of what Forrester does, right? They publish the wave. Uh, they take everything they want to rate on two different dimensions, the strengths of offerings and the strategy, as they call it, also known as? Yes, it's also known as how close can we rip off the Gartner Magic Quadrant without getting sued? But the Gartner Magic Quadrant was sort of the, the name brand in this space. They rate different offerings, products, companies, stuffed animals, anything they want to, on a pair of axes. And up and to the right is where the leaders are. That's, those are the great folks. And then low and to the left are niche players, which is Gartner speak for crappy. Gartner also publishes the hype curve, right? Trying to place a particular technology or discipline or practice on this lovely herb that moves it from technology trigger, peak of inflated expectations, the throat of disillusionment, scope of enlightenment, and plateau of productivity. So for example, three, four years ago, most of the conferences I would go to were about microservices, right? We were at the peak of excitement, and I think some of it has passed, and now we're starting to see tooling, we're starting to see patterns, we're starting to see understanding how to apply those approaches, architectural approaches, in the right context. By the time something becomes appropriate for production in this model, it's generally fairly boring. There aren't too many people who are excited about what operating system they're running things on anymore, as a for instance. So we believe that there is a different source of information you could use. Who here have thought or heard of uh, ThoughtWorks Technology Radar? If you haven't, highly recommend it. Gets published about once a quarter. ThoughtWorks is the company that employs the only person I know in the world who gets to rename design patterns at will. Martin Fowler, who famously said, you know what, the inversion of control is too complex. We're going to call it dependency injection. It was in five weeks, everybody was calling it dependency injection. That is some excellent thought leadership. Best of all, it's free. Frugality is a thing. Right. ThoughtWorks looks once a quarter at four different dimensions. They look at techniques, tools, platforms, languages, and frameworks. And when they publish the radar, they classify each of those quadrants into several concentric rings. Adopt try, assess, or hold. And here's an example from the last one that came out, I think, two and a half weeks ago that allows you to do that. But beyond that, every single item on this radar comes with context. You can click and understand why they rate things the way that they do and map how well those things do or don't apply to what you're doing. Oh, if how much they may have paid Gartner. <clears throat> Yeah, tomato, tomato. The point, though, is if you just blindly take whatever they recommend and run it, you're just doing a very defensible form of cargo culting. There's probably better ways. So what you've just seen are different types of what we call, or what the industry calls, maturity models, right? You have the Gartner MQ, you've got the Forrester Wave, you've got the Hype Cycle, you've seen the technology radar. Let's talk a bit about those maturity models so we can understand them. Sure. Now remember, it's very important you don't read the slide. Oh, I'll, we'll let the audience to read the slide. Yes, then. we'll let them sit up. But you can focus on one part of it. Yeah. I think the most interesting part about this quote from Martin Fowler when he thinks about competency and maturity models is like we discussed in our talk yesterday, for those of you who have attended it, metrics generate incentives, incentives generate behaviors. So as you're thinking about maturity models in the context of your business or your development team, be careful as to what you measure. People optimize behavior for what they're graded on. If you incentivize salespeople incorrectly, they will sell a thing that costs you $10 to make for $8 a piece. Why? Because yes, it destroys your company, but they get to buy a boat now. So let's talk a bit about key components of a good maturity model, starting with evaluation factors, right? Every single one of you can build one probably for your technology organization and figure out what's important, what are the key factors, what are the key dimensions that are important to you to evaluate them, right? Those factors have to be reasonably well-defined, reasonably consistent, and reasonably finely grained. If you grain them too coarsely, the benefits you're gonna gain from the model are gonna diminish. Generally so. It also depends on how you wind up assigning scores to these things. It's important to make sure that the weights convey 
an accurate representation of things. Otherwise, you have people trying to game the system and jump on the thing that's worth a lot of points, even if it doesn't generate a lot of value. It, it almost feels like you're gamifying your, infra your environment in some cases. It'll feel more and more like that the further away your scoring methodology deviates from reality. Ideally, your model allows for a team to do a self-assessment before somebody from outside does and easily compare and contrast the results. As a consultant, I sometimes come in an organization and I ask the team to do a self-assessment and I'll do my own independently. And the gap itself is an interesting indication of self-awareness and understanding of what best practices are. Indeed. It's also important to track your progress. It lets you know how long you've been on this journey how far you've come, how close you are to realizing it. Uh, we discussed yesterday in the keynote that absolutely nobody believes burndown charts. Fair, but this at least gives you some slightly more accurate data as you track where you are on that journey. To continue on the story of tracking, we believe that your model has to be easy to visualize and easy to comprehend because at some point you're going to show it to stakeholders that don't care about the 300 individual factors you have considered to score yourself or to build your roadmap. Absolutely true. For example, his business plan is written in CRAN. It's very important as a result, as he has learned, to use bright primary colors. Otherwise, it gets very confusing to read after your eighth beer from a sippy cup. Or at an executive offsite after a bottle of wine. Same thing. Let's look at a couple of examples of what you could do for a maturity model. Here's a sample model that looks very similar to Gartner Magic Quantum that has two dimensions, process and tools. Here's an example uh, that I've used with the team. When we've assessed the team and they did their own self-assessment, they placed themselves roughly here based on filling. In this case, it's a glorified Excel that has a chart in it. So the team placed themselves somewhere here. Uh, we did an independent assessment from outside. We had a discussion, very objective discussion, based on the weighting and the scoring criteria described in the model. And we determined they're actually slightly to the left, right? And just this gap itself was indicative of some of the problems we needed to help the team with. That gap alone is worth exploring and understanding because it tells you a lot about self-perception in your company. Here's another example of how that model continued to evolve with the same team. So we started with the rating today and we were able to build a roadmap on how the maturity model would reflect the maturity of the team a couple quarters down the road, right? This is something we could go demonstrate to the rest of the organization, including the product management team, because sometimes some of the work you need to do to move those dots to the right, called technical debt, well, it's not really technical debt. There's a return on investment here as well. Uh, we talked a bit about that in our talk to yesterday with Baruch. And then we also went and defined a long-term 24-month target for the team. You'll notice that that 24-month target is neither all the way up, nor is it all the way to the right. Having a perfect score as your target is a recipe for heartbreak and disappointment. Don't do that. The other interesting way you can use a maturity model like that visualized uh, as a square is healthy team competition. Indeed. It's very helpful sometimes to have different teams assess themselves and show where that is. Uh, because there's nothing quite as motivating as being publicly shamed in your own organization. Now, outside of sociopaths, no one actually believes that that is a terrific way of motivating teams. But it is handy to get an assessment. If different teams are further ahead in some models, terrific. Great. How do you start circulating that how they're working and what they're working on to other teams? When teams are falling behind, what is, what's the gap? Is it based upon culture? Is it based upon the fact that no one has gone in or out of that team in 25 years and they're ossified? Is there something else at foot? It helps you remember that your company is an entity itself. It's not just one dot. It's many of them. In an organization with a broad portfolio of products, and I was an executive with CA for several years with 200 products under management, a maturity model like that actually allowed us to determine where we're willing to invest money and where we can get actually decent return on that investment in the right time because we had an objective view of the capabilities of the individual software team. And that becomes important when you have a lot of them. They may be using different technology stacks. CA grew a lot through M&A. So you have a lot of different backgrounds, different tool chains, et cetera, et cetera. And if it really makes you feel better, you can put a whole nother quadrant on this and just refer to this as the one that's up and to the right. It doesn't change your reality of your situation, but it makes some people feel better. So let's look at what are some of the factors, an example of a factor's definition in such maturity model. Here's an example from this one, right? We have a category, right? It's called on-demand releases. This particular category consists, uh, belongs to the tools uh, area, 
It has a kind of general purpose mission statement as to what we believe we're trying to achieve by rating this particular category. And then you have a number of very fine-grained factors that can be rated on the right side, right? In terms of your partial achievement, yes, fully achieved, no. This was a very simple model, yes, partial, no. Uh, I will show you another model where the scores could be not needed, on the roadmap, partial sum, partial march, complete, and differentiating. Another way to skin that cat. It's a 47-point spectrum. Number 34 is the best. Afterwards, it starts going down again. What? Why yeah. is that 34? I have to wonder. Exactly. So here's another one from the same model, right? This time, we're assessing a process, right? Ability to release on demand. Like it goes into the process dimension. It describes the stated goal for this particular part of the assessment and has the relevant factors. Right? This, is the this, this granularity of the factors is what allows you to have a very detailed conversation with the team you're trying to help or trying to evolve, or even self-assess as a team to evolve specific items on the roadmap because they have to be digestible. Right? If the factor is such that it takes one Scrum team for a year to move the needle, you're probably not going to make any progress on your maturity model because it will feel too overwhelming. Absolutely. This is one way of approaching it. It's not the only way. There are different approaches available as well. Take us away, Corey. Why not? Let's talk about the idea here, where you wind up effectively breaking down uh, across a wide variety of different areas and focusing on the benchmark, where you should be with this. Incidentally, note that most of those are not 100. You don't need to be perfect in, on every axis. No one is. A realistic assessment of where you are today winds up adding some value to understanding where, what the gap looks like. And then a realistic depiction of where you're going to be in a couple of years or so. It's not perfect, and it does speak aspirationally in some cases, but note that there's a very clear upward trend of improvement. However, there's also going to be some things, for example, where FedRAMP, if we take a look there, it's, it's nice to have it, but at the time that this was done on a company, they had no regulated workloads, so they didn't need to do it. There's no realistic chance that they're going to do that, so why even focus on it? Now, at some point in the next two years, if that changes, yes, oh, now it's time to reassess. Suddenly, FedRAMP becomes more important, and resources can be diverted to that. In this particular model, we also have taken an approach of defining different weights from a different organization's perspective. You'll see on the right, you have the software team, you have the operations team, and you have the overall business perspective. And for each of those key factors, we determined from a perspective of each of those teams that were more siloed, how important each area of the maturity model was. Operations wants code to be always shippable. The business doesn't really matter as much to them. Same with engineers. It, it's 5 o'clock. It's drinking time. Right. And here's an example of that. Right. You'll see where one line, I know it's a bit difficult to read on the screen, must have for engineers, not relevant for ops, and must have for the business. Right. Yeah. Here's another line below that, not relevant for the dev team, more relevant to the ops team, and ah, maybe OK for the business. Right. Those dimensions will help you, uh, uh, if you have a complex organization with multiple teams, those weights will help you uh, be able to leverage the same model, but tweak it appropriately to the needs of the individual business. Now, we talked a bit about importance of fine-grained scoring. Corey, you want to tell us a bit more about that? Absolutely. It's, it's not yes or no. It comes down to a realistic assessment of where you are on a particular slope. It's also important to look at this from a timely perspective, where what does this look like honestly today? Not you hand it to someone and they quick write a bunch of crappy code and ship immediately, and then they can somehow come back to being able to, OK, check the box. That's not helpful, and it's not an accurate diagnostic at that point. So hopefully we convinced you that maturity models are a viable mechanism for you guys as influencers, and sometimes very useful mechanism if you just have the influence but not the authority to help organizations move forward on the maturity curve, but also to apply context to some of the things you're trying to do. Exactly. It always helps to get people invested up front and so they understand not just what you're doing, but why and how. Otherwise, it feels like you're dumping busy work on them and you're not likely to see any sort of meaningful cultural change as the project evolves. It more or less becomes something the PMO does in isolation and no one ever sees it. 
Letting the team do the self-assessment, as we talked about, is a great uh, uh, mechanism for both generating awareness, right, when they have to go through all of those factors. I just wrapped up a, a conversation with a company that received investment, and, uh, and then the investors asked me to swing by, and we spent two days on site going through a 350 factor assessment that stimulated a lot of the conversation of what good looks like, what good look should look for us in the context of our business, and what, would, what good should look like 24 months from now, right? Absolutely. It also helps to partner with companies that are not, with groups in your organization that are not thrilled with the status quo. There are some groups that are content to more or less do the same thing ad infinitum. Others get frustrated with how things stand today and are eager for change. Those are often internal teams and assets you can leverage to help drive this throughout the rest of the organization. It speaks to how you influence rather than command. Generally speaking, no matter where you are in a hierarchy, you're not going to be able to get what you want by force. Not very often, anyway. Remember, being at the top right of the model is not always the goal. And it's actually always nice to have a stretch goal in the model, right, to, to, to aspire to something. But you're not going to be at 100%. Otherwise, I think, like, if you see that your teams are achieving 100%, your model is probably not stretching you enough or not thinking about it enough. Or right? it's a polite fiction that bears little resemblance to reality. Oh, yes, come work here. We're perfect in every way. Yeah, if someone says that to you during a job interview, you can tell they're lying because their lips are moving. Much like your businesses evolve from time to time, you also have to evolve your model, right? Your targets, your weighting, your characteristics. A lot of businesses change from, sell, from making socks, one of Corey's favorite examples, to oh, being yes. an e-commerce company selling socks online and personalizing them. Absolutely. It's hard to get there. And it's not always something that you can necessarily do alone. And obviously, if you can do this alone, there's you should. No, there's no shame in asking for help. The hardest part of rehearsing for that was stopping our mouths from making the cash register sound involuntarily. <laughs> Nailed it. But to sum this up, in, in all reality, cargo cults are facts of life. Conferences drive some of them. And our advice to you that, you know, if you, if you think you're at level two on this maturity curve, right, before you try to jump to level four, level five, why don't you get to level three first? then think about level four, and only then figure out if level five is even appropriate. You can't or, skip rungs on this ladder. You just can't. And remember, the entire point of this talk and the point of doing it this way is to remember one valuable point. You, you are, are not, not Netflix. Netflix. <laughs> With that, we have the real uh, wrap-up for this talk. A couple resources. I'm at Ellie Goldnick on Twitter. And I'm at Quinnipig. The conference hashtag is a great place to discuss this, and the AWS drinks hashtag is a great place to drink yourself and sense it after you wind up hearing about how companies are doing this. There's, there's, there's no silver bullets, but alcohol helps. Before we move to Q&A, we yes. have a couple useful yes. guiding principles. We are thrilled to take questions, but first let's talk about what isn't a question. Your resume, even if phrased with a question mark at the end of it, I'm sorry, it's not a question. Similarly, calling bullshit on the entire premise of everything we have just said, while remarkably astute, is still not a question. And of course, a long, rambling, pointless story doesn't entertain anyone and is also not a question. You can, con you can consolidate all three of these with a great compression algorithm into one. That's not how we do it at Google. All right, and now for real so questions. So with that said, does anyone have any questions? <laughs> <laughs> Fight me. Yeah. All yes. right, right over there. Um, so uh, have you uh, read the Dorr report, the state of DevOps? <coughs> what are your thoughts on that report, and are they really accurate? I have not. Have you read the report? The one out of Puppet Labs or a different one? Yeah, Puppet yes. Puppet the, it's, accurate and so, it's as accurate as the data that feeds into it. The, the problem is a survey design tends to, especially for multiple companies, is something that is always challenging. One of the reasons the Gartner and Forrester reports are invaluable and more accurate than a lot of those things is they sit down under deep NDA with these companies and go into stupendous depth. When an answer exposes a line of inquiry, they go down that path. 
whereas the, uh, uh, when I took that survey myself for several years in a row, a lot of it felt like small, medium, and large, not potato-shaped. So that wound up, a lot of it didn't really fit. You can discern general trends, especially year on year for things like compensation range, but as far as technologies that are exciting and things that are growing, it's helpful, but I wouldn't take it as gospel. And Particularly with respect to Puppet, love them though I do, they aren't exactly neutral. They have a certain, they benefit from a certain perspective of not doing everything purely immutable, of still doing configuration management in place, which is a very real thing that still exists outside of San Francisco. But it's the sort of thing that does require some context to understand what's behind so it. So to add to that, given context, if you didn't have the pleasure of being analyzed or covered by Gartner or Forrester, feels worse than an annual checkup, right? It is done on a deep NDA with the vendors. And I think one of the benefits those vendors do have, even though we sometimes enjoy mocking them, is they get to see both the sell side, they have customers asking them for help and advice and guidance, and also have way deeper understanding of the business of the companies that they cover on the ADA, and they go deep into financial sales velocity, whether you're private, you're public, the roadmap, the unreleased software, right? So they have much deeper understanding that even somebody who has neutral as ThoughtWorks who can only analyze their data based on information available from outside. Yes. Please. Um, so Hit point number three. Laura has, yeah, yeah. sorry. No Laura has split an offer of puppet to your point about that, and now they're doing it independently of Vendor. Oh, wonderful. I did not know that. Yeah. Thank you. That's just a recent thing. Perfect. Again, I have no problem whatsoever with Puppet, to be very clear. Yeah. I just can't pretend that they're completely neutral and don't have it's a okay. dog. It's okay. That video fight. is already on YouTube. Damn it. All right. All right. Follow up? So, so, so I'll do a very simple one because I know Corey has, the question was DevOps versus SRE. I, well, I'll, I'll, context is important. For me, DevOps is the software delivery methodology, is not a job description or a role at the company. SRE is. Oh boy, here we go. Corey? I'm on the program committee for two different conferences, one with DevOps in the name, the other one with SRE in the oh, name. Oh, that's so right. I'm just going to irritate everyone. And we, and, I'm on yeah. the one called DevOps, because sometimes things end up that way. <laughs> Indeed. As a job title, I find it is pointless semantic quibbling. Uh, effectively, the functional role of the ops organization is what 20 years ago we would have all called sysadmins, and we were happy with that. I've done the exact same job and been called at different times a sysadmin, an operations engineer, a systems engineer, a site reliability engineer, a DevOps unicorn, don't get me started, and probably five other things that they only ever yeah, said behind yeah. my back. Rainbows? Exactly. Yeah. And it comes down to quibbling over semantics past a certain point, and I think it ceases being helpful. There are aspects of the SRE methodology of how they address uh, uh, making sure that services at large scale are reliable. It doesn't always apply. I think that sprinkling the DevOps magic has sort of been, to some extent, uh, subverted by companies trying to sell DevOps in a box. They're all words that express very ethereal concepts. If you ask five people what any what either of those terms mean, you're going to get no fewer than seven answers. So as far as whether it's the right move, as far, whether it's as for what that means in the larger industry, I don't think there is such a thing. I think it's going to differ incredibly based upon the company culture in question. Are you going back to context again? I think so. Does that answer your question? I mean, there may not be a terrific kind of authoritative. No, no. Site reliability engineering is a discipline that is much broader than system administration. It's trending, forecasting, monitoring, advising architecture teams, thinking about cost of unit economics, but it's highly specialized in one area of product delivery lifecycle covered by Agile and DevOps, right? Focusing on one of the areas I would argue for an SRE team, especially smaller one that is not subdivided into specialists, is to be the enabler of the DevOps process across the entire organization with tools, CI pipelines, metrics, et cetera, et cetera. So again, 
There's a broad process, part of it is handled by SRE, but SRE is way beyond just being a system administrator. And it generally needs executive sponsorship. One of the key tenets of it is that certain things have to be done by product teams in order for SRE to accept responsibility for running a service. So being Cold. able to say, no, I'm not gonna support that, isn't something you can generally drive from a bottom-up perspective. And uh, interestingly enough, both of the maturity models that we showed you, uh, you know, as you go and do the process assessment, there was the a factor in that assessment called definition of done, right? That's what the team has to meet before they can hand off an artifact to the next team, right? Here's an example of how you can drive that behavior by including it in a maturity matrix. Yeah. Let's see if anybody, other, other folks have other questions, because we're going to be here if you want to ask more questions after yeah. that. Yes? So I've used, sure, I've used maturity models. Uh, my, my last consulting game wrapped up last week and the team was two scrum teams, right? And the goal of the maturity model was here. We just got an venture capital investment. We understand that things are ain't peachy based on the diligence that was done. Can you help us build a roadmap, right? So you can apply a maturity model, a very small organization, and hold on a second, and they will demonstrate progress to the investor. That's one application. In a multi-product, multi-team environment, I would probably consider doing it with, uh, if you have a couple products, number one, if you want to do A-B comparison for investment planning, for team competition, that becomes useful. I think depending on the maturity of the team, if you need to demonstrate the value and the ROI of the investments you're asking for, for the non-functional backlog, right, things that product management or the rest of the business may not care about or understand, maturity model may be one of the good examples to demonstrate ROI because you can take it down to brass tacks from this omnipotent statement, we're gonna work on technical debt that nobody understands, right? It's like, hey, we're gonna increase profits. Well, how? You can demonstrate those factors and you can take the conversation down to brass tacks with your business as to how each of those specific factors, right, is relevant to what the business does based on the pay points you understand and how some of them to demonstrate that you're mature about your maturity model are not relevant to the business and you're not even gonna to try to solve them. It also depends on where it's being injected within an organization. If it's a relatively small team that does this and it's something that's self-driven, it, it can be done at surprising, surprising degrees of success. You also see it being brought out company-wide as part of some executive's uh, pet project because they read it in in-flight magazine somewhere. And then there, we all have had consulting projects that are artifacts that no one looks at again. It doesn't buy you much. Do you think the teams need improvement? Do you think the teams are not able to move forward along the maturity model without a factor? Do you have a demographic on the team that wants to see that improvement? Because it feels good when like one quarter you're here, two quarters down the road, you move, then you can stand up on a quarterly all hands and say, by the way, we were here, we're here, this is why, this is what it did for us as a team. Continuous improvement drives engagement from the development team or this is what it did for the business. For example, we reduced the time to release, our velocity increased, MTTR and defects went down because all of those things were tied to this, right? Oh yeah, that's right, feedback. If it sucked, it sucked. If it didn't, please fill out the forms and leave them on the table. We certainly appreciate your feedback, guys. You can also give feedback in the form of a question starting with, you know what your problem is, and then take it away. <laughs> All with right. that, we again, with thank you guys. This is for real. Yeah, thank you very much for coming.